Most federal prisons are well-funded. They provide three hots and a cot like clockwork. Heck, well-behaved prisoners at most federal prisons can even buy themselves a small TV. It's at a 500% markup, but it's better than nothing. This isn't your typical federal prison though. This is what I refer to as a black site. A secret facility where the government can dump those who it deems enemies of the state without the process of an actual trial. I was offered this job for the same reason all the other guards were. I'm a piece of crap. I was a military guard in Guantanamo Bay. I was tried and convicted on brutality charges by a military tribunal. At the end of the trial, a man in a tan suit approached me and offered the job. Facing a dishonorable discharge, I didn't hesitate to accept. I realized something strange was going on during my very first day on the job. I had driven to the address the man had given me, but it led to a desolate shack off the back roads in the mountains. I approached the unpainted, rusty door, and an elderly man in overall stepped out. What do you want? He crinkled his nose, looking me up and down. Um, I think I might have the wrong address. Thanks, though. My turn to walk away. What's your name? Excuse me? You getting smart with me? I said, what's your dang name? He shot tobacco spit out of his mouth like snake venom. Martin. Martin Gonzalez. I could have easily folded the guy in half, but the last thing I needed was another conviction. Okay, come on in then. What? God dang it, kid. It's your first day here, and you're already pissing me off. You're a guard, ain't ya? So, get your butt downstairs and guard. He stepped into the shack, mumbling obscenities under his breath. A rusted mining elevator sat behind him. Go on now, get down there. The warden's gonna tell you in two if you're late on your first day. I obliged as confusing as the ordeal was. The elevator jiggled and creaked as it slid down the rocky dirt shaft. I struggled to make sense of the situation. Why had the man given me an address in the middle of nowhere? Why would a prison be built here? Why the heck did I agree to step on this rickety old elevator? Suddenly, the elevator rocked, knocking me against the side rail. Gears scratched against each other, groaning in mechanical torment. It jerked as if the pulley would break loose at any moment. My breathing quickened as the elevator slammed to a halt, and the old incandescent light bulb above me flickered out. Below me, a hoarse cluster of screams bellowed out. It sounded as if a choir was being slaughtered as they sang out in horror. My knuckles turned white as I gripped the railing beside me. Something crawled onto the bottom of the elevator, violently swinging it back and forth while grunting melodically. I collapsed and I placed my head between my knees, trying to regain control of my breathing but the screams and shaking came to a stop as quickly as they had started. The light bulb buzzed back to life, and the elevator door slid open. Sitting on the job already, Gonzalez. The tan-suited man had a thick South Carolina accent. No, sir. I shot up and I snapped to the position of attention out of habit. Now, now, the man chuckled. This ain't the military anymore, son. You can relax a bit. Just call me Cartwright. Um, okay. Thank you, Warden Cartwright. Just Cartwright. Not Warden, not Sir. None of that BS. That goes for everyone here. We all come from a military background, and we prefer not to be reminded of all that courtesies that come along with it. Okay, Cartwright. Where were all those screams coming from? Screams. His brow furrowed. <laughs> what screams? 
I heard something while I was in the elevator. It sounded like a group of men were screaming. Oh, that. He chuckled. That's an old elevator, son. That was built for miners back in 1886. In fact, this whole facility was originally a mining shaft. The government had it converted during the Cold War. We're about a mile underground, so sometimes the echo from the tunnels can build to a crescendo and make odd noises. I'm sure what you heard was nothing more than the scratching of the elevator railing. But the power went out. Yeah, that'll happen from time to time. More often lately, it seems. Not to worry, though. There's a hand-operated crank at the bottom of the elevator, in case of emergency. Now, let's get to your duty station. He escorted me down a long, ominous hallway, passing up inmate cells as we moved. The first hall was filled with older men, maybe in their late 70s. Some sat on the edge of their beds, rocking back and forth. Most were lying down flat on their backs, eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. All of them were completely silent, almost inhumanly quiet. You could hear a pin drop in this hall. What's up with these guys? Why are they so quiet? Cartwright slammed to a halt and bore his eyes into mine. Well, we stole their screams, son. Strapped him down and sucked the screams right out. That's what you heard in the elevator. The grinder, we call it. You what? I could see my eyes dilate in the reflection of his. No, oh, I'm messing with you, son. Cartwright slapped his knee and bellowed out with laughter. These are the older prisoners. The ones from the Cold War era. Most of them are in their 70s or their 80s. 40 years in this place it takes a toll on you. And don't pay them no mind. They'll die off soon enough. I fade to chuckle. Listen, he continued. You already know how the shifts work. Y'all be locked down here for 12 days straight, followed by a one week off and then repeat. You sure you're ready for this commitment? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Well, you best be ready. Once that elevator locks, it can only be activated for an emergency. I nodded and continued forward. We arrived at my duty station moments later. It was a small cell block with four cells on either side. A large enclosed desk sat at the far end. Seriously, Cart, you're sticking me with this new guy tonight of all nights. A muscular, heavily tattooed guard stepped out from behind the desk. He ran his hand through heavily greased hair as he spoke. Settle down, Peters. There ain't nothing special about tonight. I said I'll be putting those ideas into Gonzalez's head. Cartwright responded. I'm heading to my bunk for the night. You two boys play nice now. Come on. Peters mumbled as Cartwright left. So new guy... What branch? Navy, I responded. Master at arms, military police. No crap. His face lit up as he suddenly shook my hand. I was a master at arms myself. I got out six years ago. Been here ever since. I'm gonna have to let Williams know we got another Navy guy. Everyone else is mostly army. A couple marines like Cartwright. Come on, you can't stand those guys. Willie, that old guy in the shack. I think he was Air Force. They sure know how to pick him. I responded. So what did you mean when you said something was going to happen tonight? You already feel it, don't you? The screaming noise, the power outage. It happens every couple of weeks. And the prisoners will sometimes riot because of it. What? Why? Just BS rumors they started. They tell stories about where these screams come from. Tell each other that it's a demon in the lower levels that we sacrifice a prisoner to each month. He laughed. Cartwright said something about uh, sucking out their screams. Oh yeah, he chuckled. That's another one of the rumors. Anyway, since you're the new guy, you've got first watch. I'm heading to the break room for some shut-eye. There's not much to it. 
Just hang out at the desk here and make sure that the inmates behave. He tossed me a large key ring before marching away. It didn't take long for one of the prisoners to introduce himself. Hey, you, new guy. A smug, Jersey accent called out as Peters left. I approached the offending cell to see a short, dark-haired inmate who looked as if he hadn't eaten in days. Russo. He stuck his hand through the bars. Francesco Russo. Y'all can call me Frankie. How about I just call you inmate? Bah. First day here, and you're already a dick. Hey, just so you know, I'm not like the other guys locked in here. I'm innocent. He made a cross over his heart as he spoke. Yeah, I've heard that one a thousand times. What'd they lock you up for if you're so innocent? Well, I'm a mind reader. He smirked. I can read people's thoughts. Used to do it as a potty trick. Let's just say I read the mind of the wrong congressman at a cocktail party. He didn't find it too amusing. The next day, I woke up in here. The look in his eyes was genuine and warm. What he was saying may not have been true, but he definitely believed it was. So anyway, he continued, What are you in for? No offense, but this doesn't exactly look like your dream job, big guy. I kicked an inmate's butt because he wouldn't shut up. Got kicked out of the military for it. My smirt. You remind me of him, as a matter of fact. His eyes widened before he had the chance to respond. Russo, you freaking scumbag. Peter's voice shot through the air, bringing the conversation to an abrupt stop. He sprinted towards the cell, snatched the key ring out of my hand, and started unlocking it. All right, all right. Frankie stepped back, just as Peters burst into the cell and dropped him with a punch to the gut. What did I tell you about talking to the staff, you piece of crap? Peters growled as he kicked Frankie in the ribs. You think you got special privilege around here? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Frankie covered his face with his hands. Yeah, right you are. My heart stopped beating in my chest. I closed my eyes and... I'm in Gitmo. A prisoner is being beaten by two other guards. They just keep hitting him and hitting him and hitting him. And I stand at the door, doing nothing to stop them. The crack of Frankie's breaking nose snapped me back to reality. Peters had his fist cocked back, charging up another blow. Stop! I caught his hand. He's had enough. Peters yanked his arm away so hard that he nearly broke my wrist. I'm going to let that one slide because you're a Navy guy. He shoved me into the cell wall. But if you ever grab me like that again, I walk your butts into the grinder myself. The grinder? So it's real. He turned towards Frankie, ignoring my question. You're up next, inmate. I'm going to make sure of it. He spit as he stormed out of the cell. Man, I hate guys like that. Frankie coughed up some blood as he spoke. The ones who hit the inmates. So, guys like me then? I asked, cause I'm just like him, remember? Nah. Frankie responded. You're more like me. Innocent. Frame for something you didn't do. What, you read my mind or something? I joked as I helped him up. No. Frankie shook his head. I didn't have to. We're gonna have to get you cleaned up. Do you know where the medical wing is? I'll escort you. Don't worry about it, big guy. There's no point. What do you mean there's no point? My sentence was cut off by a deafening shriek. I stumbled towards the cell door just as the power blew out. Security lights spun the cell block into a deep red, emitting a blaring warning siren. The ground convulsed below me and the screaming reverberated so powerfully, I could feel it in my soul. It was as loud as a tornado alarm. My heart raised in my chest as I collapsed onto the floor, hyperventilating. Loud noises had been my worst enemy since my last deployment. Get up! Frankie cut my hands over my ears. You need to get out of here before the other guards come. 
What's happening? I yelled, hoping that he could hear me over the commotion. A team of eight guards, led by Cartwright, burst into the cell block in full riot gear, marching two by two. The grinder, he shouted. It's real. I had to read his lips to understand his next sentence. And they're coming for me next. Somebody kill that alarm. Cartwright marched the pack of guards forward with military precision. Peter sprinted out of the cell block. Both the alarm and screaming convulsions ceased moments later. Get your butt up, son. Cartwright barked. This is the second time I've caught you sitting on the job. There won't be a third. Yes, sir. I snapped to attention. The need to follow orders superseding my fears. And this is the second time I told you not to call me sir. He snarled. Now... If you'll kindly get out of my way, this inmate is coming with me. I turned my head back towards Frankie. He was sitting in the corner of a cell, shoulders slack and blood gushing from his face. Russo attacked me, Cartwright. I pointed to Frankie's blood on my uniform. I popped him so hard that I think I broke his nose. I'm taking him to medical and then making him clean my uniform by hand. This inmate has a prior engagement, Gonzalez. He raised his eyebrow. We don't allow inmates to miss appointments in this facility. I understand that, Cartwright. But I assume you don't allow them to assault guards without proper punishment either. It's my first shift on the job. What will the other inmates think if I don't deal with this? Cartwright's glare turned my mouth dry. The guard unit towered behind him like stone statues eagerly awaiting their leader's order. He took his time surveying the cell, letting his gaze fall from Frankie's beaten face over to my bloodied uniform. Hmm, he sighed. Well, I suppose you're right. The inmates' appointments will have to be rescheduled. And do what you have to do. Just make sure it ain't nothing medical can't fix. I heard Frankie stand up behind me. Alright boys, a change of plans. Carwright commanded his minions. Let's move on to the next cell block. I watched them march off without blinking. Holding Frankie back with my right hand behind me, Peters glared towards us from the desk for a moment before following after Cartwright. What the heck did you just do, big guy? Frankie coughed. I think I just saved your life. How about a bit of appreciation? Yeah, at the expense of yours. What the heck were you thinking? We gotta get out of here. I know you're pretty banged up. We need to get to a ma- I mean, we need to get the heck out of here. Don't you get it? You've been here two friggin' hours and you're already pissed off the warden and the lead sergeant. Guards have gone missing for less. I've dealt with guys like that much worse than those two in the Navy. I think I can handle myself. I placed cuffs around his wrists. Now, lead the way to medical. I escorted Frankie down the adjacent corridor. The hallway seemed longer than I remembered. The men who were once silently rocking themselves back and forth were now lying on their backs. The scent of death rushed my nostrils as we reached the end. One of the inmates had expired. Jesus, I gasped. I need to get a medical team in here ASAP. Don't bother, big guy. They have a crew run through here every couple of days to clear out the dead ones. Frankie responded. Frankie, I halted. I've heard so much BS from Cartwright, Peters, and now you. Tell me what's going on around here. Tell me about the grinder. I need to know. Haven't you heard? Frankie walked forward without facing me. They suck out the prisoner's screams and they sell them to a demon. Don't freaking BS me, Frankie. Tell me the truth, you owe me that much. I don't owe you nothing. Frankie cried as he stopped to face me. You think I know the truth. I have no clue what's going on around here. Take a look around you. It sure as heck ain't nothing good. That dead guy that you're so worried about. He was fine until a couple of weeks ago when he got picked. When they brought him back. He looked about 30 years older and wouldn't talk. Now look at him. Frankie gazed into me with eyes full of tears. You need to help me get out of here, he continued, 
If not, I'm as dead as he is. You think I'm going to risk my job for you? My livelihood? My wife left me the day I got kicked out of the military. If I don't give her a thousand bucks a month for child support, I'll never see my daughter again. You think somewhere other than this crap hole is going to hire me with a dishonorable discharge? Oh, so that's what this is. Just following orders, right? Right. I growled, pushing him forward. We continued the rest of the walk in silence. I couldn't help but wonder what was really going on in the facility. Demons weren't real, were they? What purpose would a demon have with human screams? And how would Cartwright go about sucking them out? Frankie stopped to face me once more when we had arrived at the medical bay door. Look, I just want to say, thanks for the save of my neck back there, big guy. I got a little worked up, but I do appreciate it. I need one more favor from you, though. I'm not helping you escape, Frankie. Don't ask me again. It's not that. He hesitated. I've got a letter in my back pocket. The medical officers will confiscate it if they ever find it. It took me two years to find a piece of paper and another three to get a hold of a red marker. Please, just hold it for me while I'm in there. I want to ask you for nothing else. Fine. I sighed as I uncuffed him. Let's go. I grabbed the letter from Frankie and opened the door. I was immediately hit by the sickly sweet stench of rot and ammonia. Little Frankie! A frighteningly large inmate bellowed out as he approached us. He must have been at least seven feet tall. Mizzy! Frankie exclaimed, while giving him a playful punch to the gut. How many times do I have to tell you not to call me little? How can I help you, sir? Izzy addressed me as he lightly shoved Frankie out of his way. Inmate Russo had a bit of an accident and needs to get cleaned up. Are you the one who takes care of the appointments? Not exactly, sir. I'm the facility's medical doctor. Well, how friggin' rude of me. Frankie interrupted. Ismail, this is Officer Gonzalez. He's one of the good guys. A big guy. This is Izzy. He used to be a medical officer in the army back in the day. He got caught patching up wounded enemies. And now he's stuck down here with the rest of us. Why would you do that? I had to crane my neck to meet his eyes. Didn't that go against your orders? Sometimes doing the right thing is more important than to follow in an order. Me gave a faint smile. There's the new guy. A blonde, stocky officer approached me from the doorway with the voice of a lifelong smoker. He was half a foot shorter than me, but his body was an intimidating mixture of muscle and fat. He looked like he could punch a brick into a diamond. The name's Williams, he reached forward. Peter said that you'd be down here. Nice to meet you. I shook his hand. Is he looking for me or something? Nah, not at all. I just came to give you the grand tour. Follow me. Williams led me back towards the hallway. Izzy started cleaning up Frankie as we left. So, you've already seen our main units. Williams said as he walked. I'm gonna show you where the power supply room is in case you ever need to shut off the alarm. What's up with that thing anyway? It's gone off two times since I've been here. The generator down here is from the 1930s. A big, ugly diesel thing. If too much power is consumed at once, the alarm gets tripped. All we have down here is light bulbs or computers. What could possibly be using so much energy? I'm gonna give you a word of advice. William stopped and turned toward me. Don't ask questions around here. You'll end up with a target on your back. I was curious like you when I first started. I almost got my butt canned. I got a dishonorable discharge, so I would have been crap out of luck. Wait, you got a dishonorable too. You don't get it, do you? He scoffed. We all got one. Me, Peters, even old man Willie up in the shack. 
You think Cartwright hangs out at the military trials because he's looking for the best of the best. He's trying to find guys who don't have any other options. He scanned the corridor before continuing. And another thing. Don't get too close to these inmates. The boss man and Peters already got their eye on you after that stunt that you pulled. What stunt? Taking Russo to medical when he got picked. That inmate has had it coming after what he did. What did he do? I asked, raising my brow. He tried to escape a few months ago. Stabbed a guard in the process. The guy's been on medical leave ever since. You're his replacement. Did he tell you why he's in here? Yeah, he did. He said he read a congressman's mind at a cocktail party and got busted for it. No, it was more than that, brother. He started walking down the hallway once more. The guy is a con artist. Russo would pretend to read someone's mind to distract a crowd while one of his buddies pickpocketed the wealthy looking ones. One day, he stole a USB stick from a ranking member of the intelligence committee. His biggest mistake was plugging it into a computer to see what was on it. That's what landed his butt in here. Are you saying that he lied to me? Are you saying your surprised an inmate lied to a corrections officer? Me chuckled. We were stopped by a sudden convulsion below us. The tremor rocked the ground so hard that specks of dust rained from the ceiling. The medical bay door burst open down the hall. An inmate started sprinting towards us with blood spurting out of his side as a deep cacophony of screams echoed around the facility. Looks like no power room after all. William shouted as he ran towards the prisoner. Let's go! I chased after him with the ground still trembling with aftershocks, the lights flickering. William shoulder tackled the inmate just as the sirens began to blare, painting the hall in an all too familiar red hue. I stumbled backward, startled by the sudden commotion. The echo of rushed footsteps called out from behind me. What the heck are you doing, Gonzalez? William shouted as he struggled to detain the crazed inmate. Help me! I rushed over and I grabbed the inmate's arm, snapped out of my trance by the sudden command. He had a large gash running down his left side. It was so deep that some of his intestines were spilling out. We slipped and stood over a pool of blood as we grappled him into submission. Peters barreled towards us as we held the inmate down, leading a group of four guards. Out of the way, he screamed, barely audible over the blaring siren. The guard unit descended upon the seasoned inmate, shoving us out of their way. One guard held each of his limbs as Peters pulled out his baton and prepared to strike. He's not fighting anymore, I shouted, placing myself in front of Peters. You better fall in line. Peters threw me against the wall, holding me in place with the baton at my throat. Or you're next. His dark, circled eyes glowed a fiery red with every spin of these sirens' lights. I shoved him away from me and sprinted towards the medical bay. I had to make sure that Frankie was okay. I heard a sickening crack ring out above the siren as Peters began striking the inmate. My lungs were burning in my chest by the time that I reached the medical bay. My heart was pounding with anxiety. I pushed through the door just as the alarms were silenced. I found Frankie trying to shimmy his way up some sort of service elevator cable at the far end of the room. What are you doing, Frankie? I called, trying to catch my breath. I'm getting out of here, big guy. It's a long climb, but I think I can make it. You should come with me. You're not safe here, trust me. Trust you. I shouted as I ran over and pulled him down. I did trust you and you lied to me. Get off me. He yelled, pushing me away. Or what? You gonna stab me like you did that other guard? Frankie hesitated for a moment before continuing. I got family too, you know. My mom back home in Jersey. I did what I had to do to get back to her. Look at this place, big guy. Dead bodies in cells, guards beating inmates. You can smell the stench of death in this room, can't ya? My hands trembled as I gripped my fist. Looking around the room, 
Frankie was right. I took a deep breath, the overwhelming scent of rot tickling my senses. I'm getting out of here, big guy, with or without ya. He started climbing up the elevator cable once again. I watched him in silence as he climbed higher and higher, gritting my teeth. Just before his feet pulled out of sight onto the next floor, I heard a thick, South Carolina accent call out from behind me. Going somewhere, inmate. Pull that goddamn inmate down from there, Cartwright commanded. I stood frozen in place, my toes clenched in my boots. That's an order. A burning sensation tangled through my nerves. I rushed forward and I pulled Frankie down with a hard thud. Ah, oh, what the heck, big guy? He squealed. Peters burst through the door with his four stooges. The mere sight of them caused Frankie to curl into the fetal position. That's a good boy. Always following orders. Carwright said as he moved towards me and placed a hand on my shoulder. But you should have let him go. Maybe he would have come back to save ya. The sharp crack of Peter's baton sent my body into a seizure. I heard the shot at the base of my skull before I felt it. I fell to the ground, convulsing face to face with who I realized was the only person I could have trusted. What the heck? Frankie cried as he wiggled away from the guards. What'd you do that for? Get Russo back to his cell, Cartwright ordered. Stars danced in my vision as the room faded to darkness. Cartwright knelt next to my face to ensure that I heard his next words clearly. Man, prep a new inmate for the grinder. I must have passed out because the next thing I remember was being dragged face down with my hands cuffed in front of me. I had a coppery taste in my mouth, and my vision was still blurry. The sensation forced me to vomit. Let me go! I tried to wiggle free, but my captor's grip was too firm. I'm a correctional officer. I work here. Not anymore. It was William's voice. He was dragging my 190-pound body at walking pace, and didn't sound the slightest bit exhausted by it. I told you not to ask any questions, not to disobey or cause problems. Look where I got you. My clawed at the floor in desperation. My fingernails made a high-pitched scratchy noise before two of them lifted from my skin, and another was torn completely off. I clenched my hands at the sudden, searing pain of the exposed nerve. Stop fighting. William's pace slowed momentarily. It'll only make them enjoy it. It'll all be over soon. I have a family, I yelled. They'll notice that I'm gone and they'll call the police. Cartwright doesn't leave loopholes. He's drafting your death certificate now. Probably gonna say you got shivved by an inmate on your first day. He'll offer your ex-wife half a million dollars as a death benefit. She'll happily take it and never question a thing. I tried to pull away, but Williams had tightened his grip on my ankle. It felt like it was being squeezed by a vice grip. I pushed up on my cuffed hands, and he tugged my leg so hard, I busted flat on my face. I let my cheek drag across the floor, leaving a snail's line of warm blood and teeth bits. I closed my eyes and thought about the inmates back in Guantanamo Bay. How he must have felt exactly how I felt. Helpless, terrified, regretful. Tears burned my eyelids as I realized I was just like Williams. I never hit the inmates in GTMO, but I didn't do anything to help them either. I never made any reports or filed any grievances. I just stood there and watched. A good boy, just like Cartwright said, always following orders. I had been complacent for the second time in my life. The first time got me a false accusation. The latter got me an appointment with the grinder. What? What is it? I sputtered. At least tell me what the grinder is. A deep sigh escaped William's lips as I heard a large metal door creak open. You'll learn soon enough. 
He said as he lifted me over his shoulder. I just wish it didn't have to be this way. Williams carried me into a decaying and white operating room. A massive diesel powered generator sat near an open dirt tunnel at the far end of the compartment. The tunnel's opening resembled a bear's cave. The tile floor was battered to the brink of deterioration and stained brown from decades old blood. He placed me onto an ancient operating table, removed the handcuffs and strapped me in place. I yanked my hands against the straps until my skin tore, and I jolted my body back and forth, slamming my head against the cold metal table until I ran out of breath. You don't have to do this, I exhaled. Yes, I do, he responded. Or I'll end up exactly where you are now. Williams walked over to the wall and slammed a red button. The operating room spurred to life. A massive surgeon light flickered on above me, casting a spotlight on my body as Cartwright walked into the room with Izzy, the medical director. I hate to do this to you, son, Cartwright said. But you've caused far too much trouble in the facility. You see, you had some real potential, and it just pains me to see it go to waste. And Cartwright meandered around the room, casually picking up medical devices as he walked. Now you'll finally get to meet her. All your questions will be answered. Inmate Ismail is going to get you prepped while Williams and I get the generator running. Izzy lurched forward. Frowning as he cut my clothes free with medical shears, I arched my back at the sudden touch of the cold metal on my bare skin. He pulled a pre-filled syringe from a drawer beside the operating table and tightened a band around my left bicep. Nah, none of that. Cartwright grabbed his wrist. I want him to feel it. My eyes watered as I watched Cartwright and Williams leave the room. I'm sorry. Izzy whispered as he slipped the pill into my mouth. This is the best I can do. Chew it so it works quickly. I shuddered at the chalky, metallic taste the pill left in my mouth. The effect was almost immediate. My head felt heavy, and the world turned into a calming blur. Izzy set the unused syringe down on the bedside table and followed after Cartwright and Williams. I lowered my head back and forth, pulling weakly at my restraints. My breathing slowed. A warm sensation tingled from my feet all the way up to my head. It was euphoric. Chains clanked together as the diesel generator whirred and buzzed into action. The sound was deafening. It violently shook and shuddered, shaking the ground and ceiling around it. Dust felt like raindrops from above. A cacophony of screams poured out from the tunnel, awakened by the sudden explosion of noise. The warm sensation turned to cold in my veins, straightening my posture. I pulled and kicked, slamming my body against the restraints as the screams grew louder, moving their way out of the tunnel, footsteps pounding faster and faster. A bitter chill poured into the room. Every light clicked out at once blanketing me in darkness. A massive, spindly creature appeared at the tunnel opening. It clacked hungrily as it crawled towards me on all fours. I could barely make out its humanoid frame in the darkness, but I could see that it had a surgeon's mask over its skeletal face. Its head was tilted back, and a hundred deafening screams poured out of it all at once. My body trembled under the creature's hot breath. I tugged my left wrist in desperation, barely feeling the sensation of the skin degloving from my hand as it pulled free from the restraint. I reached my now skinless hand up and pulled the mask away with a wet slab. A gaping hole rested where its mouth should be. It slowly bent towards me, its gaping maw acting as a vacuum. I tried to scream but the air was sucked out of me. My bloodied left hand flailed helplessly for a moment, before weakly falling to my side. I fought to inhale, but every ounce of breath was being sucked out. I felt a sharp, intense line of pain slide down the left side of my torso. I looked down to see the creature cutting an incision into my body 
with a razor-like claw. I couldn't fight anymore. I looked into the creature's empty, expressionless eyes, hoping for a miracle. My stomach bloated as it slid its bony hand inside of me, pulling out my intestines and throwing them beside me with a wet plop. I squeezed my eyes shut and tried to remember the euphoric feeling from before. I tried to remember my daughter's face. I tried to remember any happy memory that I could. But still, the sensation of having the scream sucked out of my throat was too overwhelming to focus on anything else. A heaviness crept over me. I felt the creature hesitate for a split second, just before the alarm blared into the room. The creature jolted away and scurried back into the tunnel, intimidated by the explosion of noise. The alarm was silenced almost as quickly as it had started, the generator dying at the same time. The lights flickered back on. I turned my head to the side and puked. Everything was a blur. The pain was unimaginable. My head fell to the left to see the metal door slam open. My eyes crossed, double vision blurring as I failed to focus on the person shuffling into the room. Please, I mumbled as I started to lose consciousness. Just end it already. The blurry figure leaned toward my face and whispered as the restraints clicked free. I'm gonna get you out of here, big guy. I groaned as Frankie slid the moist intestines into the warm slit on my belly. I could feel remnants of rock and dirt scraping my exposed flesh as they entered the weeping wound. My stomach painfully bulged as he separated the flaps of skin, scooping my innards back in by the handful. I know, big guy, I'm doing my best, but I'm not a friggin' doctor. His blood and grime stained hands trembled and his eyes darted around the room. I need to find some stitches or something. Frankie yanked the medical table's drawers open one by one, spilling out the contents until he found a medical stable gun. This is gonna have to do. No time for the fancy stuff. The cold plastic device stung my skin as he pressed it against me and squeezed seven times. Each staple sent a white-hot shiver of pain through my nervous system. My head dropped weakly to the side. Hey, I need to stay awake. Frankie lightly slapped my face. You ain't dying on me. I looked down and noticed part of my intestine had been stapled outside of my stomach. I told you I'm not a doctor. He shrugged. Come on, let's move. Frankie swung my arm over his shoulder, glanced at the syringe on the table, and put it in his pocket. This might come in handy. We moved down a narrow hallway, steam hissing from the pipe light and dirt walls. My legs trembled, buckling as I leaned into Frankie for support. The floor shook slightly below me, and I could hear the faint sound of screaming emanating from the room behind us. The creature was making its way out of the tunnel. You came back for me, I croaked. Why? Because that's not how I am, he smirked. Plus, I owe you one for saving my butt earlier. Consider us even. We're gonna get to the elevator and- No, I interrupted. We need to shut this thing down. We need to get to the power supply room. What the heck do you need to go in there for? This facility is diesel powered. I learned a bit about diesel engines in the Navy. If we close off the oil supply, we might be able to destroy this place. I have no clue where the power room is, big guy, but I'm with ya. We continued down the corridor until we heard a pack of guards marching forward. Frankie pushed open the nearest door before they noticed us, and we snuck inside. The room was chilled and had several rows of surgical tables, much like the one I was on just moments before. A few of the tables had bodies on them, covered haphazardly with white sheets. Holy God! Frankie said as he pulled one of the sheets off. What'd they do to him? The man's body was pale, hollow, and had a large, unhealed scar on the left side. It was the man that we had found dead earlier. I think that thing is harvesting organs. The warden is feeding it prisoners. What the fu- I cupped my fleshless hand over Frankie's mouth before he could finish. I could hear footsteps approaching the door.
I pointed to two empty tables and Frankie nodded in understanding. We both climbed on top of one and covered ourselves, trying to slow our breathing as the door opened. What do you mean he's gone? The warden's southern drawl was unmistakable. I thought he was strapped down. He was, sir. Normally, we give them the sedative to keep them from fighting the restraints. It sounded like Izzy's voice. Don't give me that stuff, son. I heard him rip the sheet off of a body behind me. You think he could have yanked out the restraints after being disemboweled? Look at this wound. This prison has hardly lasted a week after having half their guts pulled out. I understand that, sir, but... Someone must have helped him. He pulled the sheet off another body. It wasn't this guy. He's dead. Warden, I think. Will you win on this, inmate? The cover ripped off the body next to me. Did you help him escape? My heart dizzied as I felt him grip the sheet just above my head. Cartwright. I heard Peters bust the door open as the warden released the sheet. Inmate Russo is gone. We can't find him. God dang it. Cartwright's voice faded as he marched out of the room. Do I have to do everything myself? The room remained unnervingly silent as we held our breath, waiting for Izzy to exit the room. You guys can come out now, he said. There were only six bodies in here earlier. Now I count eight. You son of a gun, Frankie said as he pulled free from the sheet and confronted Izzy. You knew this whole time. You knew what they were doing to us. We don't have time for this, I sat up. Izzy, do you know how to get to the power control room? Izzy released a deep sigh before speaking. Go out the door and to the left. Follow the corridor and go through the very last door. There will be a stairway. The power control room is at the bottom. I stumbled off the table, nearly losing my balance before being caught by Frankie. He put one arm under mine and helped me to the door. Hey, sir. Izzy called out as we left. I was just following orders. The corridor was darker than we had entered the morgue. The convulsions were more sporadic and violent. I stumbled against Frankie as we walked, struggling to hold myself up. I could hear the metal door from the grinder room banging down the hall. We arrived at the stairway door to find it locked by a keycard reader. Crap, Frankie yelled. Uh, do you still have your keycard? It's still my first day. I choked on a laugh. They didn't even give me a name badge. Where do you think you're going? We turned to see Williams standing behind us with a walkie-talkie in his hand. A surge of heat flowed through me. I stood as tall as my broken posture would allow. We're going to the power room. We're shutting this place down. I stared him in the eyes as I spoke. Williams looked to the floor and hesitated for a moment, fiddling with the walkie-talkie in his hand. He clipped the device to his belt and approached us. You're going to need this. He handed me his ID card. Now punch me in the face. What? I stammered. Punch me in the face so they... Frankie popped him in the jaw, knocking him out cold before he could finish the sentence. I always wanted to do that, he smirked. I slid the ID card through the scanner as a deafening clang rang out from down the hall. The creature had busted down the door. The alarm system triggered, drowning out the fluorescent lighting and pouring red sirens throughout the facility. The alarm bells were louder than ever. Nowhere to go but down, I yelled at Frankie. We entered the dark stairwell, a heavy scent of musk and diesel sting in our nostrils. As we continued downward, the roaring of the engines slowly drowned out the alarm. The power room was more of an engine room. Four school bus sized engines were lined up next to each other, two of them chugging with energy. I tried to yell to Frankie but the engines were so loud, my voice was muted entirely. I wandered around trying to figure out which valve was the oil supply. Steam spewed from the hot pipes, fogging my vision. 
I started slamming them shut at random in desperation. My skinless hand twitched and trembled, but I gritted my teeth and pushed on. Frankie caught sight of me and joined in, shutting every valve that he could find. The engines roared in agitation, angry that we had just shut off their fuel source. Gray smoke poured from every bolt hole, and then began to rack and shake powerfully. I dropped to the floor and I covered my ears, pulling Frankie down with me. The explosion was thundering. The entire room nearly collapsed. I stood and felt a hot drip of blood trickling down my ear. The power was completely dead. No lights, no alarm. Nothing but the sound of hot smoke and groaning metal pipes throughout the facility. This old place is gonna blow, Frankie yelled. Uh, to the elevator, now. He ran towards the stairs ahead of me. I could hear his feet banging along the steps before stopping suddenly. Frankie, I called out, slowing my pace. I heard a quick scuffle before Frankie came rolling down the steps, hitting the ground in front of me with a thud. Peter stood halfway up, baton in hand. You've caused a lot of trouble for us, Gonzalez. He smacked the baton against his hand. I think I'll feed you both to the grinder at the same time. A thousand screams roared out from behind him, closing in. Mmm, right on cue. He made his way down the stairs. Let's make sure neither of you put up a fight. He moved quickly down the steps, the screams not far behind. Dust fell freely from the ceiling, mixing in with the smoke. It's a shame, he said as he raised his baton to me. You had such potential. Frankie pulled Peter's leg from under him and grabbed his arm before he could strike. Hold him down, he yelled. I grabbed Peter's other arm and pinned him to the floor. The beast was larger, angrier than before. It snarled and crawled towards us at an inhumanly fast speed. Turn away, Frankie, I shouted. Wait, no, not me. Them, you idiot, the... Peter's sentence was sucked out before he could finish. I pushed myself up with the baton in my hand, grabbed Frankie, and sprinted up the stairs two at a time. We had to be quick while the creature was distracted. The hallways were littered with inmates, mostly wandering aimlessly like zombies, others dragging themselves across the floor. The cell doors must have lost power in the explosion. This way, I said, pulling Frankie towards the elevator. I ran inside but realized that there were no control buttons. I told you, son. The only way that the elevator turns on is if I say so. Cartwright approached from behind. So stand down. Let us leave, Cartwright. I glared at him. This whole place is gonna blow any minute, and the creature is on its way. There's no use in fighting. I said stand down. Now that's an order. He barked. Screw you. I cracked the baton over his head. And forget your orders. I hit him several more times as he laid quivering on the floor before approaching Frankie. The screams were making their way towards us once again. We had a precious little time before the creature arrived. There's a hand crank. I stepped into the elevator, looking up at the cable. You get in here, I'll crank it till you get to the top. And then you activate it for me. You think you can crank that thing with no skin on your hand? Frankie chuckled. The place would blow up before I made it halfway up. I felt a sharp pain in my back. I reached behind me with my good hand and pulled the syringe from my shoulder. My vision immediately became blurry, and I collapsed onto the elevator floor. I meant it when I said that I was going to get you out of here, big guy, Frankie said. Find my mom for me. Let her know her Frankie finally did something good for once. Frankie, wait... I moaned. I watched the creature open its mouth over Cartwright as the elevator door slid shut. I fought to stay conscious as I slowly creaked upward, foot by foot. The box shook and twitched, ready to give out at any moment. When I finally reached the top, Willie stood before me with a fat dip of tobacco on his lip, the night sky shining behind him. Dang it! Are you the one down there causing all that dang racket? 
What the heck happened to you, boy? A massive explosion rang out in the shaft as I climbed out of it, followed by a smoke plume. The screams continued in anguish. Oh, God. How long have you been down there? Twelve hours, the timing of all this don't make no sense. Willie, I sputtered, barely able to lift myself. Just shut up. I stumbled to my car, turned the spare key and drove off. I spent the first few days in a motel far from home, unsure if the government had anyone trying to hunt me down. Last week, I tracked down Frankie's mom. It turned out that she had passed of a heart attack just four months after Frankie had disappeared. Her neighbors think that it was because of a broken heart. My place they note that Frankie wrote on her gravesite. I don't care if the government comes for me anymore. This time, I'll be ready. I called my military lawyer up and requested another trial. I'm going to tell them the truth about what happened in Guantanamo Bay. I'm going to tell the world about what happened in that underground prison too. I only have one problem. I've been hearing a distant cluster of screams outside my window every night. I think they're getting closer.